Ever since families started cradling around the television, almost every local citizen has benefited from its services daily. It has spurred such local legends as Esky the Weather Wizard, Raj Higgins, and Monica Hannon. It is a brand with almost universal familiarity and the successor to one of North Dakota's oldest businesses. KFYR and Hoskins Meyer with your host Randy Hoffman on History Talk, where we step back through local history to explore the people, places, and events that shaped our community. History Talk streams exclusively Thursdays at 10 a.m. on KFYR+. Plus. KFYR has humble roots to a small retail store founded by Robert D. Hoskins in September 1898 at 213 Main Avenue. It was then known as Hoskins Cigar Stationery and Flower Store. Hoskins also owned Capital Bookstore, founded that same year inside the recently completed Tribune Block on the northwest corner of 4th Street and Broadway Avenue, where KFYR TV still operates today. In 1909, after the Tribune Block's expansion, Hoskins relocated his original namesake store there. Philip J. Meyer, husband to Hoskins' daughter, Etta, later partnered in the business, along with Robert's son, Brooks. It became Hoskins Meyer in 1922. Most probably remember the Hoskins Meyer name for its flower shop and greenhouse, the continuation of the retail store Robert Hoskins first founded. The first greenhouses were built in 1900, and as time progressed, Floral increasingly became the center of the retail business. Hoskins Meyer vacated its downtown location in 1997, consolidating operations to its greenhouse located at 302 East Avenue E. It closed in 2008. KFYR Radio was the company's first step into broadcasting. It was originally a 10-watt AM radio station when founded in 1925. Broadcasting at frequency 550, KFYR's first official broadcast was the Elk Band Concert on February 8, 1926. The radio studio was located in the music room of the Hoskins Meyer Building in the present-day television studio due in large part to North Dakota's wide open prairie, combined with having the tallest transmitter tower at the time. KFYR's radio signal broadcasted across hundreds of miles, reliably being received across four U.S. states and two Canadian provinces. The wide coverage helped make KFYR radio valuable to national advertisers from day one, in addition to local advertisers. KFYR established an FM counterpart on 92.9, now KYYY, known by most as Y93, in 1966. The radio group sold off in 1998. TV for 53 was a marketing pledge Meyer Broadcasting, then parent of KFYR, made in anticipation of launching Bismarck's first television station in 1953. KFYR was one of three television stations to begin broadcasts in North Dakota that year the others being in Fargo and Minot. The FCC originally granted four television channels for Bismarck. Expanding from radio to television was considered risky. It was expensive, and many doubted this unproven new medium. You had no audience, you had no programming. The equipment is 10 times as expensive as radio equipment. The towers and the antennas are much more expensive. So it was a very scary thing. KFYR's original cost estimates for adding a TV signal were $280,000. And of course, this was with sharing existing facilities from its other business operations. KFYR first started planning for television in 1949. At that time, the investment costs were too prohibitive. Plans escalated in summer 1952 when a Texas businessman named M.B. Rudman applied for a Bismarck television license ahead of KFYR, along with licenses in Fargo, 
Minot, Billings, and Galveston, Texas. KFYR responded by making its own application with the FCC in December 1952. Both Rudman and KFYR applied for Channel 5. KFYR wanted Channel 5 to correspond with its 550 AM radio signal. To avoid FCC intervention mediating the conflicting requests, Rudman changed his application to Channel 12. Both were granted licensure on March 4th, 1953, but Rudman abandoned efforts for a Bismarck station, owing to the difficulty having competing stations in the same market at that time. It wouldn't be long before a second TV station did join KFYR on Bismarck Airwaves, when KBMB, now KXMB, began broadcasting in 1955. Despite the coincidence, the MB does not stand for MB Rudman. KFYR TV's first broadcast on December 7th 1953 was a test pattern for residents to adjust their television sets, which in most cases were only recently purchased in anticipation of Bismarck's first television station. Viewers were mesmerized by the ghostly test pattern being sent to their homes from KFYR's downtown Bismarck control room. KFYR originally planned for December 1st, but those plans were delayed when parts didn't arrive in time to erect a full 640-foot-tall transmitter near Minokin, capable of broadcasting 100,000 watts, the maximum allowed by the FCC. KFYR erected a temporary 10,000-watt transmitter atop the Capitol, receiving the signal from a microwave relay at the station. At 6 p.m. on December 19th, KFYR held its first official broadcast. It was a message from Meyer Broadcasting President, Edda Hoskins Meyer. Television is a new medium with which so much can be done, things never before possible. For the Meyer Broadcasting Company, let me say that we earnestly hope in time we can meet all your expectations. Alongside her was Frank Fitzsimmons, KFYR TV's first general manager who was instrumental in getting local television to air. You viewers, we say welcome to a brand new and greater entertainment media. We hope you'll enjoy these programs and we hope that you can present the kind of programs that deserve your support. The broadcast day was only six hours long initially, from 5.30 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. The test pattern usually began broadcasting in the hour leading up. Broadcasts were a mix of local programming, delayed network programming, and the occasional movie. KFYR was already an NBC affiliate on the radio side, which carried over to television. Upon launch, KFYR held the secondary affiliations with all of the other major national networks of the era. ABC, CBS, and DuMont. This afforded KFYR an expanded library of content offerings. The legendary I Love Lucy was that year's most watched television show, then in its third season. KFYR did not have direct network hookup, which meant it couldn't carry live network programming. Instead, it aired content from film shipped by the studios and networks. The filmed content was poor quality, captured by a studio camera recording a broadcast on a television set. Local live programming was also limited, especially outside of the station. KFYR TV's first live national network broadcast was the World Series on September 28, 1955. KFYR received the signal through a network of microwave relays between Fargo and Bismarck, and that began live network broadcasts henceforth. The KFYR TV band treated audiences regularly.
One popular program was The Romper Room, a localized, franchised children's show that invited local children onto the set to interact with a live host. Vonnie Bender was the show's local host. We had a, a, a symbol, a, a bee, Mr. Doobie, and uh, he, through Mr. Doobie, we taught the children good manners and don't be a frowner and, and uh, do be a toothbrusher. Another popular local children's show was the Marshall Bill Show. Perhaps the first major local breaking news event covered by KFYR was the March 1966 blizzard, when KFYR TV offered endless live coverage as the storm unfolded. District by the State Highway Department and visibility is zero throughout the entire area. Police said earlier this morning some 50 to 60 cars were stuck in Bismarck at intersections, and that holds true yet. Mandan police report much the same situation, with cars stuck in streets and patrol cars running only on emergency calls. Hello, Bobby. It's time for your bath. I'm Mr. Bubble, and I give dirt trouble. I'm the funniest bubble you've ever seen. I'm fun in the tub. Just give me a rub. I help a bubble you clean. That's me, Mr. Bubble. Liquid or powder. I help bubble you clean, and I help get rid of bathtub ring. I'm fun in the tub. Just give me a rub. I help a bubble you clean. Oh, it's fun to take a bath with Mr. Bubble. RCA Victor was perhaps the station's first advertiser, benefiting greatly by KFR TV's launch. An early RCA advertisement educated consumers about this new invention flickering in their homes, the television set. There are actually 28 tuned circuits. No other make of television has more. Few have as many. That's one reason why you can be sure that the picture you get on your RCA Victor will be as free of interference as engineering science can make it. RCA was also the brand of equipment KFR-TV used at launch, something RCA was quick to point out, touting its quality. Television set sales were strong ahead of KFR's launch. Supply barely kept up with demand, especially for customized cabinets designed to match individual household furnishings. A 21-inch Magnavox was being advertised around this time for $249. Corwin Churchill was a prolific early local advertiser. It advertised five shows per week, two one-hour live shows and three syndicated shows. Almost all local advertisements were done live in the studio, which in some cases meant hauling heavy items like appliances up to the second floor. Most of the initial television personnel were KFYR radio alumni. In fact, crossover between radio and television was common for decades. Ivor Nelson was the chief engineer for both divisions. It was Nelson's enormous responsibility to oversee the installation and setup of all necessary equipment to get KFIR TV onto the air. Jack Swenson was KFIR TV's first news director, a role he already held for radio, and continued to oversee both divisions. Doug Anderson was KFIR TV's first sports director. Bob McLeod was the TV director of photography, and he would go on to become a longtime TV anchor until retiring in 1983, 30 years after making the move to television, where he was previously the radio commercial manager. Here is McLeod introducing audiences to KFR TV's studio equipment in 1953. This is just one small section of the many tubes inside a TV camera. In all, there are some 150 tubes within this particular camera. When the operator wishes to see what is being filmed, well, it isn't exactly filmed, but when he wishes to see what he's taking, he looks through the viewfinder. John Clement, Bruce Taylor, and Larry Mills were other early anchors. KFYR TV erected an 1100 foot broadcasting mast near St. Anthony in 1964 to expand coverage to the masses and begin broadcasting in color for the first time. The following program is brought to you in living color. As NBC was the first national network to provide all primetime programming in color, that tower still stands today, 
carrying KFRI signal free over the air to nearly 60,000 households across 14 counties. The 1970s evolved KFRR TV into a modern TV news station. It now showed many changes still familiar to local audiences. The Evening and Night Report, first choice for news in North Dakota. It was during this decade that television stations across the country began understanding the true value of local news coverage and invested accordingly. A new set debuted that went on to serve as the base set for more than 30 years, barring some updates throughout the years. While many familiar faces from the 1950s and 60s were gone, Bob McCloud was still a trusted face of KFIR, having been with the company since before television. Good evening. Reports from Vietnam tonight indicate fighting continues to be focused in the Mekong River Delta and along the Cambodian border. Rod Higgins had been KFIR TV's sports director since about 1963. Joining them that decade with the likes of longtimers Al Dustin, Dick Height, Dewey Hagen, Cliff Naylor, and a young intern named Monica Hannon. Raj Higgins, Al Gust, Dick Height, Cliff Naylor, and Monica Hannon are all North Dakota Broadcast Association Pioneer Award recipients, along with four other KFYR employees. Al Gustin was the only full-time egg reporter at a North Dakota TV station. He reported for both TV and radio, and remained at KFYR until 2002, before returning to KFYR radio two years later. He retired in 2012. Dick Height was already a longtime newsman when he joined in 1969. Height started his news career at age 14 with the Mandan Pioneer. Although he's only 22 years old, Dick has more experience than any other member of the NBC Newsroom staff. Do you believe nine years? Yes, Dick began his news career at 14 when he went on the payroll of the Mandan Morning Pioneer newspaper. Height rose through the ranks to news director in the 1980s and station manager in the 2000s. Evening Report at 6 and the Night Report at 10. Dick Height is a news person you depend on. He retired in 2015. Dewey Hagen became news director in 1972. On his first night of live coverage, he co-anchored election night with Bob McLeod. Cliff Naylor was hired by KUMV in 1978. He was one year out of college. After leaving briefly for work in Idaho in the mid-1980s, Cliff Naylor returned, this time to KFRR-TV, in 1988 as a news photographer. He also reported and later added weathermen to his duties. Snowfall is still occurring in parts of the lower Great Lakes regions, and that extends up into southern New England. Firefighters this afternoon contained a blaze at an oil storage tank field north of Shelby. Then a coach and mentor for many aspiring reporters. His popular Off the Beaten Path series premiered in 1995. Tonight we begin a weekly feature that's called Off the Beaten Path. Reporter Cliff Naylor will be traveling the back roads of North Dakota every week. Cliff will bring you stories featuring unique or historic sites which are well-kept secrets. This evening's report takes us to an out-of-the-way agricultural museum that's located 31 miles northeast of Rugby. As you drive down the road that leads to the Dale and Martha Hawk Museum, the vintage tractors that line the road don't begin to prepare you for what's around the corner. Cliff Naylor produced Off the Beaten Path almost every week for more than 20 years. Cliff retired in 2023. Videotape replaced film in the mid-1970s. KFIR was the first television station in North Dakota to do so. Videotape was more portable, less expensive, and didn't require processing in a dark room. It could also be reused, unlike film. Computerized weather graphics took over for the primitive weather board around that time too, which in prior years used a combination of magnets and chalk to illustrate the weather. As he had in 1953, Bob McLeod updated audiences in 1978 for the station's 25th anniversary on the current state of studio equipment. This is some of the camera equipment which KFYR-TV uses in 1978. On the surface, some of it looks quite similar to what it did in 1953, but inside it's considerably different. This is the studio camera. Two of them are used in our studios now. 
There are no tubes in them except for the picture tubes. And really, this camera contains almost four times the amount of equipment contained in that first camera used back in 1953. KFYR began televising live high school basketball in 1979, something impossible to do when KFYR first launched. Included with the games was in-depth analysis and stories on the players themselves. The local response was remarkable. More than 500 viewers sent KFYR thank you letters during the first year of coverage. KFYR broadcasted the high school games for decades and continues to air live sporting events, including the Bismarck Larks. Also in the 1970s, KFR was one of the first television stations in the country to accept network program feed from a satellite, replacing the unreliable microwave system used since the first live network broadcast in 1955. The 1980s continued building on the legacies established during the 1970s. Weatherman Jerry Bartz joined in 1982, and anchor Chuck Bartholomew the following year. The duo anchored together for 15 years. With the exception of a lagging farm economy, economists at the Federal Reserve Bank, things might be a little bit on the breezy side tomorrow, but that's the only complaint you could have. It really doesn't take long for wind chills to have an effect on exposed skin, or wet laundry too, for that matter of fact. Monica Hannon joined Chuck Bartholomew to anchor the evening news in 1984. She was the state's first full-time female news anchor, and one of the first in the nation. Monica Hannon first joined Myra Broadcasting in the late 1970s as an intern. She was later hired as a reporter for KUMV in 1982. She was one of Dewey Hagen's last hires before turning the reins of news director over to Dick Height. Monica Hannon became news director in 2004. She continues to anchor KFR newscasts to this day. The legendary Rog Higgins retired in 1989. Rog, I understand that the Class A tournaments in, uh, in Mandan and Valley City uh, have been canceled, that correct? Correct, and uh, we just had a report in from Minot that the Northwest has also been canceled. We'll quickly get through it. Four Class A regional high school basketball tournaments. Current sports director Lee Timmerman took his place. The 1990s began with KFIR providing live international coverage of the Gulf War, featuring Kerry Paulson and Dwayne Walker. Here in the rugged and unforgiving Saudi desert that the 134th is working, transporting what has become the lifeblood for U.S. troops, water. This unit takes water that's trucked to them from an undisclosed source. The water is pumped into these 20,000 gallon bladders. It's then chlorinated, tested, and pumped back into trucks to be distributed to U.S. forces in the area. It wasn't the first time KFR offered localized international coverage, nor the last. KFR began covering stories internationally in the 1970s, including reports from Germany, China, Egypt, and Jordan. 1976, we went on a trade mission to Egypt and Jordan, and it was led by uh, the governor, Governor Lenk at that time, along with some agriculture and business officials from North Dakota, some businessmen. The whole idea was to uh, sort of introduce not only wheat, but other North Dakota products uh, into that market. With photographer Dwayne Walker, this is Dick Height reporting from the Hamburg airport. NBC was experiencing unprecedented success in the 1990s, with such popular primetime programming as Seinfeld, Friends, and ER. KFYR also had the most popular syndicated programming, Wheel of Fortune, Jeopardy, and Oprah, all of which KFYR began broadcasting in the 1980s. Thank you, everybody. Welcome to Wheel of Fortune. And now, please help me welcome our lovely hostess. Here comes Vanna White. Vanna! Technology continued to evolve through the decade, as computers became more mainstay, and the station planted footings towards digital. KFYR-TV launched its first website in 1998. It continued to evolve into the 2000s, implementing many different designs and features. Today, KFYR-TV's digital presence mirrors its broadcast presence, with live streaming, video-on-demand clips, and apps for mobile and connected TVs. You're watching NBC North Dakota News. This is the Night Report. The 2000s witnessed the biggest technological changes since the 1970s, 
and KFYR began receiving accolades for its news coverage. KFYR received the area's first ever regional Emmy Award for its coverage of the June 2001 hailstorm. It looks like February in western North Dakota. Thunderstorms with winds in excess of 60 miles per hour dump hail, rain, and chaos, making driving impossible in some areas. KFYR launched the area's first 5 p.m. newscast, first news at 5, around the same time. At one point, it was the nation's top-rated local news program in its time slot. KFYR TV shut down its analog transmitter in 2009 as it made the full shift to digital. With this change, KFYR TV was able to add subchannels to its signal, which today includes MeTV, Circle, and West Dakota Fox, which was folded under the same ownership in 2014. KFYR began installing high definition equipment all the way back in 2003, but didn't make the full switch to HD until 2012. That same year, KFYR made the biggest changes to its set since the 1970s. Williston's KUMV station signed on the air in February 1957. It was the company's first television operation outside of Bismarck Mandan. Minot's KMOT station commenced broadcasting in January 1958. It wouldn't be until January 1980 that Dickinson's KQCD station joined the ranks. However, KQCD replaced a low-powered station KFYR operated in Dickinson since the late 1960s. The KFYR call letters are an allusion to its founder, Philip Meyer substituting PH with F. The KQCD call letters stand for Queen City Dickinson. KUMV call letters stand for Upper Missouri Valley. And the KMOT call letters stand for Minot, matching Minot's airport code. KFYR TV's parent, Myra Broadcasting, purchased Fargo's KTHI, which today is known as KVLY, in 1995, forming what was long called NBC North Dakota News, with television coverage across the entire state and into parts of Montana, South Dakota, and Minnesota. Over the years, KFYR TV has featured many household names. These are look back at some you might recognize. Here's a look at some of the logos used by KFYR TV during its 70 years. If you want to read more about Bismarck Mandan history, I invite you to check out my two Bismarck history books. They are available to purchase on Amazon and select local bookstores. Copies are also available at the Bismarck Public Library. Visit BismarckBook.com for more information. That was our look at KFYR and Hoskins Meyer. Next, we'll learn about the 7th and 9th Street one-way conversion. Is there a local history topic you'd like to be featured? Email suggestions to historytalk at kfyrtv.com.